But I'm going to go in a different direction than Mother's Day. Uh, those of you that know me know that I, I go with whatever God leads me with. And today I want to talk, I'm going to go into Colossians 2. And we're going to talk about how Jesus is enough. Jesus fulfills all the expectations that we need. And he is all the wisdom we need. So we're going to go into that a little bit. Um, I'd like you if you just join me in prayer as we begin here. Father, I just thank you for this opportunity, Lord, to get into your word and to share share uh, time and fellowship over the internet with each other. I thank you, Lord, that we're finally able to get this working again. And I just pray that as we go through this, you give me the words that you want spoken, Lord. That's, that's why I'm here. I'm a broken vessel, Lord, but just fill me with your wisdom and your word as we go through this. I ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, Second Colossians. Colossians is an interesting book, and we're going to get into the context of it a little bit. But I'm going to start in Colossians, not Second Colossians, Colossians 2. Colossians 2, we're going to start in verse uh, 1. We're going to go 1 through 7 today, which is only seven verses, but there's a lot of meat to it here. So in verse 1, um, Paul starts out, I want you to know how hard I am contending for you and for those at Laodicea for all, and for all who I have not yet met personally. So the context here, Paul is writing this letter from prison in Rome. He's in, he's, uh, in prison. Nero is the, uh, the Roman ruler at the time. And Paul had never been to the church in Colossia. He had actually uh, helped start the church in Ephesus, which was not that far away. And what biblical scholars believe is that a member of that church then went on and started the church in Colossia. And when he did that, they were having problems, and he came back to Paul and said, what should I do? So Paul wrote this letter. This is really what was going on. So picking it up again in verse 2, Paul writes, My goal is that they may be encouraged in heart and united in love, so that they may have the full riches of complete understanding, in order that they may know the mystery of God, namely Christ. So the goal of this letter is encouragement. Paul understands very easily that a discouraged Christian is easy prey. We're easy prey to be led astray, either by the world, by the flesh, by the devil, whatever. If we get discouraged in our faith, if we get discouraged about uh, our, our, our Christian walk, we are vulnerable. And Paul knows that. He wants to encourage and strengthen. Now, this church in Colossae has not fallen. They haven't done anything wrong. But there are people within the church that are, that are uh, preaching a heresy to them. So, as, as he gets into this, he says, you know, I want to encourage them, and I want them united in love. Now, united in love uh, is a beautiful statement. In some translations, it says, knit together in love. I like that even better, because it talks about people being knit together. And I'm not a knitter, never have been, but I have seen people that knit things together with those needles just flying, and when they're done, they, they take two pieces of yarn and just end up making something beautiful out of it that is a full garment. Um, John 17, 21 through 23, Jesus said uh, in, a, in his prayer to the Father before he left, this is what he prayed to God for us as the church. That all of them may be one, Father, just as you are in, you are in me and I am in you. May they also be in us so that the world may believe that you have sent me. I have given them the glory that you gave me that they may be one as we are one, and I in them and you in me, so that they may be brought to complete unity. Then the world will know that you sent me and have loved them even as you have loved me. It's that, that concept Jesus is praying for there is that as a church, as believers, we become a family, we become knit together. And what he asked the Father for is that as the same way that Jesus is in the Father, we should be in the Father, we should be in Jesus. That close together. That love that we have for each other should be the same as the love Jesus has for God. And if we think about it that way, what a, what a strong connection that is. And that strong connection really is what Paul is talking about here. This is what he wants for that church too. He wants the church to have that, that unity, that love. Uh, other, elsewhere in Colossians, Colossians 3.14, he said, And over all these values put on love which binds us all together in perfect unity. Now, going back to that, he also talks about uh, united in love so that they may have the full riches, full riches of complete understanding, in order that they may know the mystery of God, namely Christ. 
full riches of complete understanding. What, what's the explanation of that? What's completeness? What is complete understanding? What's the mystery of God here? What's he talking about? What is our personal understanding of the mystery of God? What, what, what is yours? If I asked you to, un, to explain the mystery of God, what would it be? Now, personally, when I look at something like that, I think of the person and the character of God. And the great mystery to me is why God loves me so much that he wanted me. Why am I worth anything? That's, that's the, the mystery. Why are we worth it? John 3.16 says, For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. That reflects back on God's character there. He loved us so much that he sacrificed for us. Uh, John 14, 6 and 7, Jesus says, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you really knew me, you would know the Father as well. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. There's that mystery laid out for us. It's all explained for us right in those passages. The mystery is that God loved us. But the knowledge that we have through that mystery, the knowledge that Paul was talking about, that understanding is the understanding that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life, and that he wants us. He wants us to come to him. That's a, that's a mystery of why but it doesn't, the, the why isn't important. The understanding that it exists is what's important. And that's what Paul's talking about here. He wants them to be encouraged, and he wants them to be united in love so that they can fully understand the love of God. So let's pick up again in Colossians 2. In Colossians 2, 3, it says, In whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Now, I, I have to put some context in this as well. When it says hidden, Okay. This argument that's going on, or this problem that's going on in the church that Paul's trying to address is Gnosticism. And Gnosticism, just to wrap it up into a little ball here, is mysticism from both the Jewish side and the Gentile side coming in. And these are people that are saying that there's secret knowledge and little things hidden away and only certain people know and only certain people get things. So there is a um, movement going on there to add to what they already know about Jesus and to add from the man side and not from the God side. And that is the problem that he's dealing with. So when he uses, when he says, in whom are hidden all the treasures, the word hidden that he used in Greek is apoknufos, and apoknufos is what these Gnostics said they had. They had hidden secrets and they used that exact word. So Paul used that exact word back to them. This hidden treasures, hidden wisdom. The wisdom is Christ Jesus alone. The wisdom is Jesus. If we understand Jesus, if we have a relationship with him, and we truly have him within our hearts and inside our lives, that's the treasure of wisdom and knowledge. And it's not like it's locked up. It's like it's, it's a, a buried treasure for you to discover. It's something to go find. That's the treasure that... The way it's used here in Greek, it's not that it's something you can't reach. It's something that's waiting for you. It's a, it's a buried treasure to be found. So, if we understand the Creator, the concept of the Creator, who He is, the fact that He created us, and we understand the concept that we are the created, so we, we put that in context, who He is and who we are, and we start to understand the relationship that we have, and the relationship that we have with Him that only comes through the love that He has for us. He loved us first. Then we start to get into the wisdom of this. When we understand Jesus, we understand everything. Every secret that you need to know starts with that foundation. That foundation of Christ. If you have that, then you can build on it. If you don't have that yet, it's hard to, hard to build on anything. So we need to seek that hidden treasure by getting into the Word, getting to know Him better, getting more and more connected with Jesus, because Jesus is enough. Jesus is sufficient for all of your needs and all that you, all that you, all that you need to have, be it knowledge, be it um, care for yourself, be it understanding your relationships with others. Jesus is the source of all those things. 
He is the Alpha and the Omega. He is the beginning and the end. He is all you need. And as you get to know Him, you'll understand that more. Until you do, you won't understand the concept. It sounds like a strange thing to people that don't understand. And when we share Jesus with people, that's something we have to understand, that we need to share that relationship building with Him. And that concept that we need to be personally responsible for those things. Each of us is personally responsible. For the attainment of knowledge, for understanding Jesus, for the relationship with Jesus, we are each personally responsible. You can't go to someone else and say, you learn it all, tell me the little bit I need to know, and I'll just, uh, I'm good with that. It doesn't work that way. Jesus doesn't want to have a third-hand relationship with you. To, to do that would be to ask Jesus just to be a friend of a friend. That's not what he wants. That's not the relationship he wants. If you truly wanted a relationship with somebody, that wouldn't be enough for you. And it's not enough for Jesus either. Jesus needs us one-on-one -on -one with him. John 6, 40 says, For this is the will of my Father, that everyone who looks on the Son and believes in him should have eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. John 14, 23, Jesus says, If anyone loves me, he will keep my word, and my Father will love him, and we will come to him and make our home with him. Again, that connection. You go to the Father through Jesus. We get connected through the Father through Jesus. We get eternal life through Jesus. It's all there. So what do you need to know? You need to know Jesus. Amen. Pretty simple. So as Paul is trying to explain this concept to these believers, and he's trying to encourage them, um, he's warning them about some of these other things too. And in Colossians 2.4, he says, I tell you this, so that no one may deceive you by fine-sounding arguments. Boy, doesn't that sound like today? Doesn't that sound like what we're going through right now? Doesn't that sound like the world that we're in? Fine-sounding arguments. People that can bring up the points that make you go, Oh, maybe that's true. Or maybe I should listen to this person. Or, Boy, that guy's got enough letters after his name that he must know what's going on. If we fall for that, it's like falling for the situation we're in right now, um, where we just follow along. We're like sheep. But unfortunately, if we're not following the shepherd, we're following wolves. False teachers can come up with easy ways to lie to you. There's so many different ways to put a fallacy in there. There's a, a straw man and all those different ways that someone can sneak a lie into you and make it sound like the truth. Deceivers are good at their job. They don't tell you, well, I'm going to tell you something, uh, uh, false truth here now, and this is my reason for telling you the false truth. They're going to come to you sounding like they know what they're saying, and they're going to come to you sounding like they have your best interest in mind, like they have all the wisdom to give you, and they're doing it just for your benefit. It's easy, easy, easy for someone to be de betrayed by that and to lose their way. And that's what Paul's saying with the easy words. Uh, 1 John 4, 1 says, Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God. For many false prophets have gone out into the world. And this is who Paul is trying to deal with in this church, and this is who we, we also need to be aware of and deal with in our own lives. There are false prophets everywhere. There are false prophets that will put whatever title they want on themselves, and they will come out and they will preach contrary to the word now the danger there of course is if you don't know your word if you are not in the word if you are not speaking with jesus if the spirit is not leading you uh what's going to lead you whatever's the most likely whatever human logic tells you should be right that's the wrong way of going about this we need to get into our word and understand this matthew seven fifteen, jesus warned about this he said, Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. Jesus knew this was going to happen in his own lifetime. He talked about it. This is something, if, if all these people are talking about it, warning John, Jesus. Now I'm going to get uh, in, into another thing Paul said in uh, 1 Timothy 4, 1 through 3. Now the Spirit expressly says that in latter times, some will depart from the faith by devoting themselves to deceitful spirits and the teaching of demons. Through the insincerity of liars, whose consciences are seared, who forbid marriage and require abstinence from food that God created to be received with thanksgiving by those who believe and know the truth. Now, if we take just that little passage, just that little piece, 
it says, uh, being the teaching of demons who forbid marriage and require abstinence from foods. Now, those sound like small things. That sounds like a little deal. A certain kind of food, a certain not a certain kind of food. He said that's the teaching of demons. It's that important. If we take that the context of all three of those passages, um, where in John, uh, in First John, John says, "Don't believe everybody, but test it, test it to the to the spirit." And Jesus says, "Watch out for the wolf in sheep's clothing. Looks like a sheep, talks like a sheep, smells like a sheep, but it's not a sheep. It's a wolf underneath." So. If we look at all those things in its totality, we see what Paul is talking about here to this church. He said, don't let them lead you astray. Even though it sounds like it's a good idea. Even though it sounds like it's something that would fit with the theology or the doctrine that you're in. Jesus said, "It's not. if it's not for me, it's not me. And John said, test it. So we test it by getting into the Word. If we know Jesus personally... Intimately, if you're in the Word, if you're having that relationship with Him, you're not going to be led astray. And it's amazing how simple that is. It's it's so simple it confuses people sometimes. If anyone challenges you, just look to the Word for truth. Ask the Holy Spirit to help you interpret it. Pray to God. It's that simple. And that bothers people that don't want to believe because they don't think it should be simple. It should be hard. This should be something that's tough. And this is what the what these Gnostics were doing with the church in Colossia. They kept trying to make it harder and harder and harder to get to know Jesus. Harder and harder to make it, to un- get a full understanding of God's plan for you. If someone's trying to make it harder, you need to back off and check them with the word. Because that's not what Jesus said. Jesus made it very easy. He said, follow me. That's it. Follow me. Colossians 2.6. Going back into Colossians now. This is part of that follow me that I'm talking about. Paul says, so then just as you receive Christ Jesus as Lord, continue to live your lives in him. Now the greatest heresy that they had at the time in in Colossia that he's dealing with, and one of the greatest heresies we deal with today, is that we have this... We have someone trying to tell you that you can perfect in the flesh what was begun in the spirit. That you receive Christ and then you can fix it after that. That there's something we can do as men to make it better. We can't justify ourselves. We can't sanctify ourselves. Only Christ can do those things. So if someone's trying to tell you, well, this is the way to fix all these things, they're lying to you. It's simple. Jesus says, follow me. Galatians 2.16 says, Know that a person is not justified by works of the law, but by faith in Jesus Christ. So we too have put our faith in Christ Jesus, that we may be justified by faith in Christ, and not by works of the law, because the works of the law, by the works of the law, no one will be justified. So if someone's trying to put rules on you, or, or limitations on, on you, and saying, telling me that they know better than you do, go to God, because God knows better than all of us. In addition, Romans 3.28 says, For we maintain that a person is justified by faith apart from the works of the law. So as we get, if we look at our own world and look at what's going on here, uh, don't we have experts everywhere? Isn't everybody an expert? You can go on this 24-hour news cycle and see experts on every possible subject. It's amazing. Uh, the old, when I was in law enforcement, the definition of an expert was someone who was more than 20 miles from home and had a briefcase. If if you were a local, you couldn't possibly be an expert, but if you came from somewhere else, you were an expert. And those of you that worked with me in law enforcement training got that concept um, portrayed to you very vividly sometimes when they go out and find someone from a long way away, bring them in, pay them a whole bunch of money, and they don't tell you anything new. These talking head concepts where these people are constantly talking and not really saying anything, but that white noise starts to just numb you out. I think the same thing was going on in the Church of Colossia at the time. They were getting these people constantly beating on them. Now they hadn't, uh, they were holding strong at this point in time, but Paul was trying to warn them of what was, what these people were trying to do. 
Romans 5, 1 says, Therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Again, very simple. Our faith, peace with God through Jesus. Jesus is enough. You don't need anything other than Him. Ephesians 2, 8, uh, Paul puts it very, very clearly in Ephesians 2, 8. He says, For it is by grace that you have been saved through faith. And this is not from yourselves. It is a gift of God. I love that passage, by grace through faith, not because of us, but as a gift. Why do we try and complicate it? Jesus is sufficient. The gift of salvation is received from God by grace only as a gift. It is a gift, not by our own efforts. The Colossians were under the threat of the same human condition that we all are. That fatal human flaw of believing that we need to earn something. Or that it isn't fair. It's too easy. There has to be more to this. That was the whole concept behind all the pagan religions at the time. They prayed to one false god and if they didn't get what they wanted, well then they'd pray to a different false god and they just kept switching things back and forth and all the way around until they got what they wanted. And basically it was just a roll of the dice hoping that something's going to happen. And that's not our faith. Our faith is 100% bought in, fulfilled by Christ. And in that we don't need to look for anything else. So, as always, I get into my sermons. How does this apply to us now? Well, all of these things Paul was talking about are applications. But as Christians... Paul is talking to the church next in, in Colossians 2, uh, verse 7. And I want to talk about that as, as my application point here then. So in uh, Colossians 2, 7, Paul says, Rooted and built up in him, strengthened in the faith as you were taught, and overflowing with thankfulness. We're, continued, we're meant to continue to live in him. We received him as a free gift. Nothing we did to get it. So there's nothing we can do to add to it. There's nothing anybody can tell you to say, well, yeah, but. There's no buts here. This is simple, laid out theology in the most clear terms. Jesus said, come to me, period. That's it. We are meant to live in him and to be rooted in him. I love that that analogy that he gives here. He, he kind of mixes them together. He says, uh, rooted and built up and strengthened. Rooted. The Bible loves that that. Uh, visual image as well. Jeremiah 17, 7 through 8 says, But blessed is the one who trusts in the Lord, whose confidence is in Him. They will be like a tree planted by the water that sends out its roots by the stream. It does not fear when the heat comes. Its leaves are always green. It has no worries in a year of drought and never fails to bear fruit. Wouldn't, that, wouldn't it be lovely if that was a description that someone gave of your walk with God? Who you are as a person. That's uh, a pers person who's firmly rooted in Jesus, and you can tell because no matter what happens, those roots are going deep and drawing all the strength they need from there, and, and nothing can batter that down. It also talks about being built up in Him. And this is another principle that I think we need to look at, own, and make part of yourself. Make it, make it part of who you are. If you're going to build something, you have to have a foundation. There's no way to build a house without a foundation. Well, you can. You can set it on the ground, but it's going to fail. It's going to fail miserably, and it's going to fail quickly, and it'll be dangerous. It'll all collapse like that little house of cards you used to make on Grandma's table. Christmas time, we always used to play poker with my grandmother, who's now passed, and it was one of my best memories. She always had a big jar of pennies. She'd bring her pennies out, and we'd play penny any poker with Grandma. And when we weren't playing poker and the cards were sitting there, as a kid, you just start making little card houses and you try and build them up as tall as you can and eventually they all collapse that's because they had no foundation they had nothing tying them to anything solid it was it was all just floating in the air our life in our process of being in jesus has to include that foundation uh jesus said that himself in matthew 7 verses 24 and 25 he said therefore anyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on the rock the rain came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against that house, yet it did not fall, because it's, it had its foundation on the rock. Jesus is our rock. 
And if we are not anchored to him, we're going to get blown apart, whether it's by false teachers, whether it's by the world around us, whether it's by our own flesh. We need to be anchored in him. Once we anchor into that, into that foundation, then we can build as many stories as we want. We can expand as much as we want, as long as we're tied to that anchor. Without it, there's nothing you can do. Ephesians 2, 19 through 22. Paul says, Now therefore you are no longer strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and the members of the household of God, having been built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone, in whom the whole building, being fitted together, grows into a holy temple in the Lord, in whom you are also being built together for a dwelling place of God in the Spirit. Now, if you don't know what a cornerstone is, Jesus is the cornerstone. He is the source of the foundation. If a bricklayer is going to, or a, a stonemason is going to lay a foundation, they have to start somewhere. And that's why you, you hire a skilled person to make the foundation and not me. Because I don't know much about it except what I read about it. And you don't want me building the foundation for your house uh, by looking up a YouTube video. But when a skilled stonemason is going to start, he starts on a corner. And the reason he starts on a corner is because everything then can be based on that. It can all be built up around that one corner. There's a reference point then. Jesus is our cornerstone. And a cornerstone on a foundation, on a, one of these stone foundations, if you were able to reach in and pull that out, everything else would collapse. So we have the Word, we have the Apostles' uh, writings in the Word, we have uh, the letters from Paul, we have the revelations of John, we have all of those things in our Bible, and they are all based on the cornerstone. So if that doesn't fit, and that doesn't make sense, and that pulls away from us, we're going to collapse. We need that. In addition to being rooted in Him and having our foundation in Him and building upon that foundation. We also need to be strengthened in our faith. And this is something that um, Paul has a tendency to use athletic analogies a lot. Run the race, finish the race, striving, combating. He's talking in sports analogies there. And to be strengthened in your faith, you have to be using your faith. Now, coaching the powerlifting team, lifting weights myself, I, I understood this concept very well, but last year it was a, an awakening for me because I've been lifting all year long, and then over the summer I faded a little bit, and then during football season, because I got busy, I completely lost it. After football season, powerlifting season started up, and I had that number in my head of where I left off. And I didn't just pause and not go forward. I fell backwards. I had to rebuild all of that foundation to go back forward again. And I think a lot of our, our spiritual lives can be the same thing. If we are not constantly working on it, it's not like it goes on pause. We slide backward. Life is, you, you heard the old story, life is an uphill battle. This hill is steep enough that if you're not leaning forward, you're falling back. That's all there is to it. Romans 8, 38 and 39, Paul says... For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. That's something you can strengthen yourself with. That's a heavy weight that you can lift and build yourself up with. You are in the hands of God, and God does not want to let anyone slip through his fingers. Nothing is going to separate us from that love because God loves everyone. I think I said this last week. There is no one your eyes have ever looked upon that God doesn't love. That is, that is an absolute truth that we can build on. Mark 11, 22-24 says, Have faith in God, Jesus answered. Truly I tell you, if anyone says to this mountain, Go, throw yourself into the sea, and does not doubt in their heart, but believes in what they say will happen, it will be done for them. Therefore, I tell you, whatever you ask for in prayer, believe you have received it, and it will be yours. Again, that's not something you do once in a while. That's something you have to have as part of your life on a regular basis. So when the mountains of the world show up, you've been in practice, maybe with molehills. 
Pray about everything. Pray without ceasing. When we do these things, we are doing this to strengthen ourselves and to keep that understanding in our mind that Jesus is enough because that's who I go to for everything. Jesus is enough. Philippians 1.6 says, Being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. Now these three passages I was talking about strengthening, and all these three passages that I just read to you, this, the common theme there is that if you focus on these things daily, that will strengthen you. If you go back to that weight room and pick up the Word and lift it up, Every day, and you go in and you put these things into your heart and into your mind and into your brain all day long. This is what's going to be in your head all day long. And that day, then, will be devoted to God because that's the way you're you're starting it out. When you when you pick up a weight and you lift it, the first time it's hard, and the more you lift it, the easier it gets. So then you add some more. It should be the same way in your spiritual walk. When you were children, you had children's stories in Sunday school. You had a coloring book. You had the illustrated Bibles that had just a few of the stories in there. Okay, great. That's awesome. That's a great starting point. As you grow and as you mature, you need to get deeper than that. You need to get deeper into the Word. You need to see more and more. You need to keep adding on weight. Because you're going to be asked for more and more as you mature as a Christian. You're going to be attacked more and more as you mature as a Christian. You are going to be challenged more and more as you mature. So you need to be ready for that and be working towards that. And looking at these passages like this are ones that you should always be grabbing a hold of. Now the last thing Paul mentioned in there, when uh, we were reading verse 7, he says, Rooted and build up, strengthened in the faith. We talked about that. As you were taught, and the last the last phrase on there is overflowing with thankfulness. Again, Jesus is sufficient. He is the all in all. He's all you needed from the very beginning. Whether you knew it or not at the time, He's all you've ever needed. And hopefully today when I'm talking to you, you understand some of these concepts. And hopefully today you start to understand that Jesus is sufficient for all. He covers everything. Because he was sent, that's, that's, that's his role. That's his role in eternity, is to be that bridge and to be the love of God manifest for us. In the Word, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God. Jesus was there at the beginning, and Jesus was also the creator of the universe. Jesus came to, came to flesh and came to, to earth with us. Jesus' deity is complete, and his, his humankind is complete. All those things, everything is complete within him. All those things that were separated came together. If you think of God and man being separated, Jesus brought that all back together again. He stitched, he knit it together. And go back to our knitting analogy. He brought us back. And that's all we need. We don't need anything else. So when Paul talks about thankfulness, when he talks about, about we should always be thankful, He mentions that in Philippians. I'm going to end with this passage here. Philippians 4, verses 4 through 7 says, Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again, rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. So now be anxious about everything, anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And there's a result when we do that. Our application of being rooted in the Word and being strengthened daily and building upon the foundation that Jesus laid for us all comes about in this passage here. Everything we do, we we thank God and we go to Him in prayer. If something's bothering you, you thank God and you go to Him in prayer. You thank Him because He's listening, because He's with you, because He's present. He said, I will never leave you. He is with you right now. You thank Him for that and you take it to Him and you lay it down and you walk away. And be grateful that we have a living Savior that we can do that with. That we can go and hand Him all of our troubles and say, I can't handle this. Because He says, I want you to come to me. I want you to bring these things to me. And if we do what Paul says, if we rejoice, if we, if we are 
understanding that the Lord is near to us if we're not anxious about anything because we go to Him in prayer and we leave it there. Don't take it and walk and take it, tie a chain to it and drag it along behind you when you leave. Leave it there with God. Then Philippians 4 7 says, And the peace of God which transcends all understanding will guard your hearts and your mind in Christ Jesus. In Christ Jesus again. Everything is about being in Jesus. The peace of God transcending all understanding will be in you. So today, as we look at our world and we look at our lives and we look at our families, we look at our homes, you look at your job, if you're working right now or if you're not working, look, look at the lack of a job. There are a lot of things that are weighing down on people right now. There's a lot of things that are filling their minds and their hearts. And none of it is coming from Jesus. None of the bad stuff. If it's a weight on your chest, that's a weight that you need to let go of. Because Jesus wants to take it from you. All of these things that the world is dumping on us right now have the ability to turn us away if we let it. Have the ability to be that whispering in your ear, that little cartoon on your ear whispering in your ear telling you things that that uh, logically and humankind makes sense. It makes sense that I should be afraid of everything, right? It can make sense that I should live in fear and hide in a hole right now and let somebody else tell me what's, what's good for me. It makes sense that I shouldn't think for myself. I should let somebody else do it. It makes sense that, you know, there are people that know better than me. Uh, that's not what God says. There is Jesus Christ. And he knows everything. And if you go to him and he says, you know what? Be cautious, but don't be afraid. Be smart about things. Be wise as serpents and gentle as doves. But don't fear. Don't be afraid. Because I am with you. And that's what Jesus says. I am with you. So if you feel like that's lacking in your life, get into the word. Renew that relationship. Get back in the weight room. Start picking it up again. Get back into it. For those of you that have lifted weights and worked out before, no matter how old you are, you can go back, because I did. Trust me. Um, but there's a feeling you get when you are full. There's a feeling you get when you're sitting at the table and you eat your fill. But there's also a feeling you get when you have exhausted yourself doing something you enjoy, some exercise you enjoy of some sort. For me, it's lifting weights. Some people, it's running. Uh, not me. Um, but there's that feeling you get when you're done where you just feel completely satiated, completely satisfied. Get into the Word in the same way. Get into the Word. Look at a passage. See where God leads you. Look at somebody else's... Um, study of that. Go to the Greek and, and, and Latin dictionaries and look into those things. Look at the Hebrew dictionaries. Look in all of those other research things you have. There is no one listening to my voice right now that can't do this. Because you're right now on a computer, on a phone listening to me. All of those things are available to you right now. If you want to read it, if you want to find a concordance, you don't have to have the giant paper ones anymore. You got it on your phone. If you want to see what the different translations all say about the same thing, Look it up. You got it on your phone. If you want cross-references to other parts in the Bible from the passage you're on, it's there. It's all laid out before you. The difference is, as Christians, we are not allowed to be passive in our Christianity. We're not allowed to be spectators. We're not allowed to stand on the sidelines. Because in the end, no one else is going to be able to stand before God for you. You stand before God. We're going to stand and look Jesus in the eye, and Jesus is going to say, okay, what'd you do for me? I gave my life for you. What'd you do with it? How'd you live your life? Nobody else will be able to stand there. No supervisor, no professor, nobody with letters after their name, no uh, elected official, no member of the clergy is going to stand there and take care of that for you. You have to do it yourself. So in this life while we are here, until Jesus comes back again, we need to spend our time getting to know Him.
getting more familiar with him and walking with him because he said, if you are in me, as I am in the Father, then you're in the Father. Jesus is drawing us, trying to draw us in. We need to surrender that and understand that if you want any answer, he is the answer. If you have any need, he is the answer. If you have any questions, he's the answer. And Jesus is enough. God bless you. I pray that this is a great day for you. And I pray you have a great week. Again, tomorrow night, um, we have a Facebook group that gets together and does a uh, Facebook Live, hopefully, situation. No, no, it's uh, Messenger. We'll it's a Messenger. Fine. Oh, it's Messenger. Jane tells me it's Messenger, not Facebook.